this lecture series continues uh, every year. Um, the point is to try to get uh, people in the community who know a lot about the Baldwins and they, they would need to have some sort of research, uh, definite research done behind them to, to prove what they're saying. But um, it would be nice for, we just want people to come out and talk about it because I know there's a lot of people in town that know a lot of things, but it stays with them and then when they're gone, the information's gone. So um, that's why we started this particular lecture series so we could get the information out there and record it as well. So, and then the recording will go into our archive. Um, we did some introductions earlier, but one more person came in, and I would like you to introduce you to her. Her name is Mary Beth Hayes. Mary Beth. She's our museum director. As you can tell from the fire engines, a little bit of heat coming in. Um, our new museum foundation is in the process of raising funds to build us a new education center, which will go in next door where the shuffleboard courts are right now. Um, and that's almost ready to break ground here pretty soon. So we're really excited about that. Uh, if you're interested, we have some preliminary renderings at the front door, and you can look at that and to get an idea of what that's going to be. But it'll be nice and enclosed. <laughs> Um, if you are interested in any of our other websites, we have lectures, exhibits, exhibit openings, we have family programs, scout programs, we do school tours, the whole gamut. So um, please check out our website. Um, and if you're really interested, you can add, our name, add your name to our email mailing list, which is on a clipboard at the front door. So if you want to add your name, um, you'll, be, you'll get emails on what we're doing. So we'll go now to our next and final speaker. Uh, Mitchell Bishop is the curator of history up at the Los Angeles County Arboretum, and I will let him expound on his background. <laughs> um, okay, expound on my background, goodness. Um, well, there was the period as a gold miner. Um, <laughs> No, actually, nothing as glamorous as that. I was at the Getty for 30 years in a variety of capacities, um, which I won't go into. Um, my primary interests are the history of technology, preservation, and uh, landscapes, historic landscapes, and preservation of landscapes. So I'm predominantly interested in things like preserving the historic landscape of the Arboretum, um, but I have also, I, I rarely do people per se, but I have done some people. And one of the people I did in the past was Phoebe Apperson Hurst, who was William Randolph Hurst's mother. And I often think of her in reference to Anita Baldwin because there are a great number of similarities. Um, they were both very intelligent women who I don't think, in, in Phoebe Hurst's case, she never knew that she was going to be one of the wealthiest women in the world. She was a school teacher in the Midwest in the middle of nowhere. She married George Hurst. He did not disclose how rich he was. She came to San Francisco and was totally taken aback to find out that she was now married to an extremely wealthy man and that she was a very wealthy woman. One of the really interesting things about Phoebe Hurst is how she adapted to that, which she did very graciously and became a, a really amazing patron of libraries and the arts. Um, Anita Baldwin, the reason why this is a fragmentary view is sadly she left instructions that her papers be destroyed after her death. And while some material has survived, for instance at the Huntington, and we have her son Baldwin M. Baldwin's papers, which very fortunately does contain a lot of letters from Anita to Baldwin. Um, and they're very interesting and revealing indeed, but you know, not that much is really known about Anita, certainly not by me, and as Dana says, the people who do know it have not written it down. For instance, the poor woman doesn't even have a Wikipedia entry. I think she went to Mills College, but I don't know for sure. Um, you know, these are all these things that you need to know when you're doing a biography or you're really nailing these things down. 
So I will share with you what I do know, but what I was particularly interested in in this talk, closer? Okay. What I was particularly interested in this talk was um, her role as a patron of the arts and the art community in Los Angeles, which I realized must have been pretty significant because she was definitely buying a great deal of material from Grace Nicholson. Uh, I think from George Wharton James and you know a lot of other people and um, let me tell you what I do know. What I do know is she was friends with Edward Weston, the photographer who lived in an area of Glendale called Tropico and um, it was later incorporated into the city of Glendale. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Edward West and the photographer, but he's a sort of an iconic photographer of the California and the West. And when Weston moved to Tropico, he was really literally learning his craft. When he first moved here, he was working as a surveyor. And the life of a surveyor in those days was pretty rough and ready. Um, and he decided that he was not cut out to be a surveyor. He had a camera, he was taking pictures on his surveying trips, and he decided he was going to be a photographer. So he started out literally going door to door, photographing babies, corpses, anything he could do, anything he could get work in. And he gradually developed his aesthetic. He had a relationship with a woman named Margareth Mather, who is a very interesting figure, who it appears really sort of shaped Weston from being a photographer of babies and dead people and whatever to being an artist because she had this vision. I wish I could talk about her because she's a very interesting person with a very wild past, which I won't go into, um, and a wonderful photographer. But this is a portrait by Edward Weston of Anita Baldwin at Enochia. And um, during this period, Weston was doing sort of pictorialist stuff. In other words, it was he and other photographers at this time period were making photographs which really looked more like um, sort of American Impressionism and were influenced very much like that. But um, What's interesting to me is, is that Weston was hanging around at Enochia, using it as a backdrop for his photographs, and clearly was you know, friends with Anita. Whether or not she commissioned any photographs from him, purchased any photographs from him, I don't know. Whether this was a commission or if he just did her portrait, sadly, I don't know. Um, Anita had an older sister named Clara, and this is a picture of Clara at Coney Island in front of those, one of those funhouse mirrors. Um, I love Clara. Somebody should do a biography of her, too. Clara had very different interests. Clara was into good times, and she was into jewelry and men. And um, she seems like she was a very generous person. Um, her morals, I think, were a little shaky, but I think a nice lady and probably a lot of fun. Um, very different from her sister, different mothers. Um, I think Anita had a very close relationship with her father. She was the daughter of Jenny G.D., I'm told by the family it's pronounced Dexter, and I think had a sort of special place in her father's heart. So unlike some people, she seems to have had a very positive relationship with Baldwin. Now, I wish I knew more about where Anita grew up. I think she spent a lot of time in San Francisco. These are some studio portraits of her as a girl. I don't know anything about her education. This is sort of fun because this is uh, one of these sort of very kind of pre-Raphaelite studio portraits in San Francisco at the time. And what's particularly interesting about the original of this photo is someone has taken a pin and pricked out the eye. Now, this is, this is Weston's house in Tropico, where he, I believe he built this house, and this is where he lived. Um, again, here, Weston, these are the years that he was over in Tropico. In 1912, Weston decamped to Mexico. He was having an affair with a woman named Tina Modotti, and he went to Mexico City, which at the time was a sort of ferment of, ferment of modernism, and kind of reinvented himself. Um, Weston's journals, his day books, are, I believe, at the Getty, and most of his stuff is either at the Getty or at the um, Institute of Center for Creative Photography in Tucson. 
And apparently his journals prior to 1912 have been sort of heavily edited by Weston. And he sort of pushed under the rug this whole sort of formative period and for his all intents and purposes sort of presented himself as being born artistically during the Mexican period. Uh, a typical example of Weston's work, which is more well known, the sand dunes up in Oceano, um, kind of up north, near south a little bit of Pismo Beach. This is the Weston that a lot of people have forgotten. And this is somebody, I think it was Weston, was very interested in contemporary dance. I know Anita Baldwin was as well. And I think that had something to do with her growing up. And obviously she spent some time at the theater at the Baldwin Hotel in San Francisco. And her father knew Isadora Duncan, who I don't know if you guys know, all know who she was, but she was one of the pioneers of modern dance. And she sort of invented her own form of dance. And she did perform at the Baldwin Theater. Um, these are photographs of, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking. It's Ruth Saint-Denis and one other woman who were early pioneers of modern dance at Enochia. Ruth Saint-Denis was um, kind of famous at the time for adopting a sort of an oriental ethos in her dance and in her costumes, which at the time was very novel. This is sort of this sort of pseudo Kuan Yin outfit. Now, this is interesting because this is another dancer wearing a white peacock outfit at Enochia. And as we know, Anita did have white peacocks. And the white peacock did have a particular special significance for her. And this is actually, uh, this is by Weston. And the previous one was as well, of course. Um, another, oh yes, a nymph of the dance. <laughs> This is, you know, gives you a sense of the period. Okay, um, an artist who's probably the one most people think of as being associated with Anita Baldwin is Maynard Dixon. Maynard Dixon is, I hesitate to call him a Western artist because that rather sells him short, but he was an artist who was born in Fresno and lived most of his life in San Francisco. He was very well known for his Southwest images. His, I believe, second wife was Dorothea Lang. Now, Anita had a nose for good people, and she commissioned Maynard to do a series of murals for Enochia when Enochia was being built with the um, apparently enthusiastic support of the architect, and he was given a pretty free hand in terms of what he did. I think he, she did have, give him some guidelines, but he pretty much could do what he wanted. Uh, this is him at work at his easel. He was an interesting man. He was very tall and extremely skinny and very active in the Bohemian Club up in San Francisco at the time, which at that time actually was a Bohemian Club, unlike a club of extremely wealthy people. Um, just This is Maynard and Dorothea Lang. Um, just a photo of them together. Dorothea Lang, I'm sure as you know, was, became very famous as a photographer during the Depression and her iconic portrait of the Dust Bowl mother and child, everyone knows. Now, uh, this is just a news clipping from the time announcing the commission to Maynard Dixon, which is kind of interesting how it's phrased. We have a couple letters by Maynard Dixon to Anita, and they're um, very interesting because the flavor of the letters pretty much reveals that they were close friends. I mean, he kind of confided his troubles to her. Um, he's saying in this one letter that his wife is near, as I read it, is, is having, going through a bad period and having a difficult time. It's interesting to me that they had a kind of relationship where he would have that kind of conversation with her. And apparently he kidded around with her a lot. You know, he is sort of jocular and makes fun of her a little bit as being, you know, the rich and idle and that kind of thing. It's the second page of that letter, an interesting letter, but unfortunately you can't read it here. Now this is very interesting because this is an oral history that was done with Dorothea Lang. Anita invited Maynard and Dorothea to go to the Southwest with her 
and you know basically go sketching and you know they went to Walpi and some of the other ancient Pueblo villages and this describes the preparations and the trip and I'm going to read it to you because it's a lot of fun when we got there this is a Dinocchio these things were unpacked oh when they got to the southwest that is you wouldn't believe what was in those boxes the lavish camping equipment all the tents and there were about 10 room-shaped tents, like Chinese pagodas. The food was most elaborate canned stuff, and I was the cook. No preparations in my way, just cans. The purchasing agent had just gone down, like going over an Abercrombie & Fitch catalog, and had just ordered caviar, and we were to be there for a month. Well, in every camping exhibition, there's always a settling down period. We had one while I learned to cook for the combination of tastes of Bill Williams, Eddie, the bodyguard, and Anita. It was a weird experience. <laughs> uh, and then I've lost a bit here somehow. Oh, and she had a personal bodyguard. This was Anita, and he was always armed. That was one of her eccentricities. She also had a small pearl-handled revolver in her handbag, which was always in her lap. And the reason for this, she told me, I asked her one long afterwards, was that the value of the jewelry that she customarily wore warranted the presence of a bodyguard and a gun in the handbag, but what a way to live, you can imagine. <laughs> um, and in fairness to Anita, uh, that was not without reason, because oddly in Baldwin M. Baldwin's papers, and I have no idea why this is the case, a lot of her begging letters were saved and some basically blackmail and sort of threatening letters. So, you know, she did have a well-justified fear for her children and herself. And of course, the reason why is there was a lot of publicity about her father's will and her inheritance. And suddenly she was this incredibly wealthy woman. Everybody wanted to get a hand in her purse and basically a lot of crazy people were focusing their attention on her. Um, she did have ties in the Hollywood community, I know. There is some sort of weird gossip about having a, her having had an affair with Humphrey Bogart, which I don't believe. Um, and she did, you know, there were contacts. And interestingly enough, she hired Frank Capra, of all people, who was later the director, to be a tutor for her son, Baldwin M. Baldwin. And this is sort of his description of how strange it was to be Baldwin M. Baldwin's tutor at Enochia, which I can imagine. Um, her collecting areas, what areas did she buy in? Well, what didn't she buy in is more like the question. She did buy a lot of Native American material, which she used in her house and up in Tahoe. She did have a house in the south of France for how long, I don't know. Her son Baldwin M. Baldwin basically lived as an expatriate in Paris in the 20s at the same time. Fitzgerald and Hemingway and a lot of other people were there, so I think she did spend a fair amount of time in France, but she spent most of her time, as near as I can tell, here and at Enochia. Um, she apparently loved oriental carpets, did collect them, um, something we always forget is that the artists like Maynard Dixon that she was collecting and working with were at the time contemporary artists. Uh, something we don't think about, but of course that's the case. She also did buy European painting and decorative arts. I know she had some Dutch paintings and some other things which she later donated or gave away. Um, just shots of two of the baskets. Um, a lot of them went to the Southwest Museum. We have a collection of baskets at the Arboretum that I'm not sure where they came from, but I believe they probably are from Anita, and why they're not at the Southwest Museum, I don't know. There's a story, and um, Dorothea Lang tells another story about how when they were in the Southwest together, they went into some place where they were selling Southwestern pottery and baskets, and she basically sort of said, I'll take everything in the shop. Um, the architect of Enochia was Arthur Burnett Benton, who was at the time a pretty well-known, celebrated architect. This is Mr. Benton. One of the things he's known for today, of course, is um, 
this is, this is something he did early on, the Arlington Hotel in Santa Barbara, which was destroyed by fire. And then this is what most people know him from, the Mission Inn in Riverside, which although he did it, some other rather notable architects were involved in monkeying around with it and making additions and doing other things. And this is a wonderful thing from Sunset Magazine, an illustration of Enochia when it was completed. Enochia was pretty unusual from the standpoint that it was a concrete reinforced building. It was sort of cutting edge building technology at the time. It had air conditioning. It had a, at the time, very sophisticated heating system. Um, the kitchens and everything were very elaborate and it had, amazingly enough, in each bathroom there was compressed air and hoses that could be used to dry hair. And they had one of those early systems where to vacuum the room, there was a central vacuum system and you simply plugged the hose into the wall and you could vacuum the room. Pretty nice. Um, so. I'm often asked at work, people are like, well, why didn't the daughters live in the Queen Anne cottage? And I was like, are you kidding? I mean, to them that was like this, you know, dad's, dad's funky old place. You know, they were wealthy heiresses and young women. They wanted, you know, the best, the latest, the most, con you know, you know, they wouldn't want to live in the cottage. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it would ever have occurred to him, although Anita did take pains to preserve the cottage. Um, she commissioned, uh, you know, Enochia is just amazing because these are two lamps, I think, designed by Benton and commissioned, made by Tiffany, that were sold at auction. Um, a silver punch bowl that was made for Enochia, sold at auction. And one of the other things that I do have a tiny bit of evidence about her role in the arts community is that when the, what was then, combined museums, county museums down in Exposition Park opened, and I believe it was 1913, and interestingly enough, they opened to coincide with the opening of Mulholland's Aqueduct. It was sort of like the water came to Los Angeles and so did the culture, you know? Although, one of the interesting things about the museum, of course, is that they um, didn't have anything to put in it as far as art goes. So, they essentially had to go around to all the collectors and wealthy people in Los Angeles and sort of scare up a bunch of loans. Um, there are constant articles in the paper that time period about collections of shells that were donated and that kind of thing. So I, I think they were getting a lot of natural history and history material, but it took them a long time to really build any kind of an art collection. Um, Anita did donate a number of pieces to the museum, and this is actually a letter from the then curator who had, was under the impression that she wanted her loans returned and was sort of saying, you know, please, please don't <laughs> leave them here. I need something to put on the walls is the unsaid thing. And then she writes a reply basically saying, you know, hey, as long as people want to look at them, you can have them, you can keep them. So. And if you look at collection records for the LACMA, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art today, you'll find a byline essentially crediting um, her donation, the family donations, but I think what's going on there, as I can tell without asking someone over there, which I haven't had time to do, is that the initial donations were sold and deaccessioned a long time ago and the money was used to purchase other things. Ah, two objects that are still in LACMA's collection. Uh, one, an ancient Chinese figure, and the other, a medal. But I'm not absolutely sure these belong to Anita or were bought with funds she donated. I'm not really sure. I'd have to check with LACMA. Music. Um, like her father, she was very interested in music. She was a composer. This is fun. This is uh, something she sent to Baldwin and Baldwin, and it's a list of musical instruments and asking him if he wants any of them. And she annotates the bottom basically saying that, you know, a number of these were in your grandfather's collection. So, you know, from this I know what I always suspected is that Elias Baldwin, being an entrepreneur, vaudeville impresario, and lover of music had a collection of musical instruments of various kinds. Um, something I'm always telling, particularly 
students and children who come to the Arboretum is that at that time, if you wanted to hear music, you either had to play it yourself or find somebody who could, and music was something that was kind of made at home, and if you were lucky, someone of great skill might be performing in town and you could go look at them, listen to them, that you did not have the luxury of being able to hear a performance by one of the best musicians on the planet over and over and over again as you want it. Uh, sheet music, the fond of and his lady love. Yaller girl. You know, it's interesting because she did a number of, for lack of a better word, I will call sort of minstrelsy pieces, which were very popular in the 20s. Um, and I can't help but think that she was probably to some extent influenced in this by the African American workers on the ranch that Baldwin recruited from the Carolinas and a lot of those people would have been born slaves. So she probably had access to some very interesting music and folklore from these people that she would have been, you know, very well placed. So you know, some of these minstrel TC pieces are probably pretty well informed. So, I mean, today they horrify us, of course, but. Culinary. Anita Baldwin was very interested in food. She privately published a number of cookbooks, which she distributed to her friends. Um, she was sending her son, Baldwin M. Baldwin, lists of her household expenses in the 30s, which included grocery bills. And it is interesting to see what kinds of grocers were available in the area and how much these things were. So exotic grocery bills would be for the sum of something like $3, $6, which don't sound like much, but at the time uh, were probably significant. So she did have exotic tastes in food at the time, which is not surprising considering she would have traveled to France. Um, the recipes, unfortunately, from the perspective of today, this is the frontispiece to one of the cookbooks, which is called The Pantophagist, which, if I understand it correctly, simply means one who will eat anything. And the recipes, unfortunately, most of which sound absolutely ghastly from the post Alice Waters perspective, the maple crepes sound good. The nectar Enochia, not so bad, but some of the recipes are pretty frightening, but apparently at the time were considered to be haute cuisine. Interestingly, I think she was very well situated during Prohibition because she had some enormous wine casks from her father secreted away in the basement of Enochia. So I don't think Enochia was ever dry. Um, not with, you know, enormous casks of brandy and various fortified wines resting away comfortably in the basement. And of course, in this photograph, which was taken prior to Enochia's demolition, you see there were wine racks. So at one time, it was probably stuffed with wine. This is um, a letter she received, which is kind of fun, which is basically a dairy out in Owen's mouth announcing that they had the privilege of being the purveyor of dairy products and butter to the Pig and Whistle restaurant. And the Pig and Whistle still exists today, not in its original location. It's had three locations, but uh, the Pig and Whistle was a sort of an innovative restaurant in Los Angeles, and what it did was it created, they were called dessert restaurants or something like that, and what they were, they were restaurants that served desserts and pastries, and the reason why this is significant is unaccompanied women or women with children could go there and have a meal or some tea or something like that. Um, if you put this in perspective, a restaurant like Musso and Frank's where Charlie Chaplin would saunter in and have a quick one and a sandwich at lunchtime, you have to remember that an establishment like that would have been a male establishment. You know, an unaccompanied woman who wanted to get something to eat or take her children out for something to eat, tired children, would not go into Musso and Frank's and Hollywood Boulevard. So places like the Pig and Whistle were a friendly environment for them to go into. And of course, the thing about Anita that I find incredibly sympathetic is her interest in animals and her concern over animal welfare. Um, 
she didn't, you know, she did inherit that apparently. And Baldwin, even though he was jailed by the Humane Society for his greyhound racing activities, was very fond of animals. And he apparently had a parrot which called him Pa and would follow him around. And I believe this is that parrot. And apparently the parrot had a, a partner over at the Oakwood Hotel who was also Baldwin's parrot. And apparently the parrot once followed Mr. Baldwin to the Oakwood Hotel and saw him stroking the other parrot and flew off in a huff and disappeared for a week. <laughs> These are the, um, the Enochia dogs in the Rose Parade wearing the livery of the Red Star Society. I don't know if you guys know about the Red Star Society. It is not a communist organization. Never was, never has been. It was in fact created to assist and provide relief and veterinary care for horses injured in World War II, World War I, pardon me. Uh, in those days, horses pulled the supply wagons. In the early years of the war, there were cavalry horses. And there, you know, there was a great deal of justified concern about the suffering and decimation of horses and mules um, along the front lines at the war. And Anita is someone who was you know, very touched and concerned about this and donated very generously. She was also instrumental in the foundation of the Pasadena Humane Society. Oop. That's it, I'm afraid. So if anyone has any questions or they would like to share anything with me, I would be more than happy to do that. Um, as I say, Unfortunately, it is by nature fragmentary. I mean, you know, one can take these sort of bits of straw or various things and kind of extrapolate from them or infer things from them. But in many cases, we just don't know. But when I think about things like the fact that she allowed Edward Weston basically to use her home as a studio, um, you know, she seems to have, well, she was generous. And she seems, despite being a very private person, to be quite generous. When her father died, he allowed pretty much anybody who wanted to to tour the ranch. Um, he figured that that was a great way to promote real estate he was selling. But I also think he was a, you know, a more innately gregarious person. He loved showing people around the ranch. He apparently was subject to sort of dramatic mood swings. Um, but I think for the most part, he was a pretty expansive guy. Whereas Anita, I don't think Anita was ever an expansive person. Dorothea Lang describes her in the trip to the Southwest. At various periods, they ran into difficulties like flooded rivers or something. She comments on the fact that Anita was basically sort of totally unflappable, took things in her stride, never complained, you know, was apparently carried across a flooded river on a chair and sort of didn't bat an eyelash. So she seems to have had a kind of innate composure and sort of dignity, which is, which is interesting. Um, an interesting person. I would like to know more about her, but I don't think I ever will. <laughs> Any questions, comments? Sir. Uh, when did Baldwin M. Baldwin uh, keep his family name? Well, when um, Anita divorced Hull McClowry, who was the children's father, Baldwin and Dextra, she reverted to her maiden name, Baldwin, and she filed for a legal change of name. So she reverted from being Anita Baldwin McClowry to Anita Baldwin. And I'm not sure she went through a formal process of renaming the children. But I don't know that she had to, because of course, if her name, she reverted to the Baldwin name, it may not have been necessary. Uh, the children did see their father pretty regularly. I don't know how that went. I suspect like a lot of custody sharing situations today, it had its bumps. And I, I don't think Anita ever had particularly good feelings about her ex-husband, who she refers to in, as the man who ruined my life. Uh, so <laughs> that, that indicates to me a certain lack of warmth, shall we say. Um, and Baldwin, I mean, it is sort of a comical name, Baldwin and Baldwin. Um, 
he's an interesting figure too. Married five times, yachtsman, pilot, playboy. Um, what can I say? You know, that's another topic. But we know a lot about Baldwin and Baldwin. So, mm -hmm. anything else, anyone? I have a question, Yeah. Some people know a lot about Dextra. Well, you know, I, I don't know because I, I've seen that there is information. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, think um, Newport Beach, Orange County, Junior League, debutante, um, museum donor and openings, um, house in Northern California, you know, relatives with a winery, that kind of thing. So, yeah. Sort of waspy, wealthy Californians. Um, a lot, the other thing is, is that Anita's personal possessions, like Elias Baldwin's, were disseminated out through the family and the relatives. Some stuff was sold at auction. Uh, descendants still have some pieces, you know. Um, unfortunately, in the case of Elias Baldwin, the auction house that sold a lot of his stuff and Clara's stuff, Clara took a lot of her father's stuff because Clara being older, his taste was pretty much her taste. And when she died, things were auctioned off and she left a lot of money to charities. She was a very generous woman. Um, so, you know, the big auction houses we have records for, but a lot of the smaller ones and local ones that handled sales like this, I don't know. Their records are gone. It's very hard to find any information out about them. So. <coughs> Although, interestingly, we have very detailed death inventories in Huntington of the entire contents of the winery, the entire contents of the Queen Anne Cottage, the adobe, the barns, I mean, down to the last zinc tub and horseshoe. It's amazing. It's great. I'd like to do something to for it, but at the end of the day, what does it tell me? You know, am I going to try to chase down these objects and see if they were auctioned off somewhere? So. I mean, you know, you have to think about return on investment when you're researching these things. Is, does this fit what I'm researching? What am I going to get out of this? You know, it can't just be some endless chase after details. So. Sorry? Um, Nokia was replaced by a gated community of, um, for lack of a better word, townhomes or townhouses. The gatehouse, interestingly enough, still stands on the corner of Baldwin and uh, Foothill, and you can see it and part of the original wall. But the only left? well, the person who bought the property maintained that it had been so badly damaged, and I forget which earthquake that it was not financially feasible to save the building. Um, preservation architects and other people have said that that's absolutely not true, but at the end of the day, someone has to pay. And no one emerged who was willing to pay to save the building, so they tore it down. I mean, either at the end of the day, either somebody has to pay, or the government, state, local, federal, has to act in some way and prevent demolition, which did not happen. Um, as I'm sure you guys know, in America we believe in property rights, so there's this constant tug of war over if you own property which in somehow is part of the public good and you cannot be allowed to tear it down because the public good is strong enough to override your right of property. So this is something in America we constantly struggle with. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Huh? I want to say thank you officially. Well, thank you. For mm. your talk today. <laughs> and Kathleen. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Oh.